Welcome to the Celtic Myth Pod Show, bringing the tales and stories of the ancient Celts to your fireside. Special episode 25, summary of the Irish mythological cycle, and also the autumn equinox, part 2. Hello, welcome to the Celtic Myth Pod Show. I'm Ruth. And I'm Gary. This is the second half of our Irish Mythological Cycle special and Equinox special for 2011. So we won't repeat all the contact details again. You'll just be getting bored of them by now. (laughs) So before we get cracking, as it's only been a couple of days, have we got any news and views? Well, actually, we do. Really? Mm. Oh, good grief. Well, you know we mentioned the Spirit of Albion film in the first half of the show? Mm-hmm. Well, it looks like they're going to be aiming at a Beltane or May the 1st release date, and the DVD should be available in a multi-region format. We'll try to keep you updated. Oh, that sounds excellent. I'm, I can't wait, can you? No, hmm. it sounds too good. We've also heard a rumour that Dave the Bard is also working on a new album, but shh, don't tell anyone. Superb. Can't wait for that. Certainly something to look forward to. Mm. Anything else? No. Let's crack on with the show and keep it all fresh in our minds. And on that note, let's have some modern bardic music from the Bards of Mystic with their track, The Fairy Queen. sat down on the bench, overlooking the fields and the forest, a few hundred yards behind the big old farmhouse. He didn't know how much more bad news he could take. Six months earlier, his wife, whom he loved dearly, had been accidentally poisoned and died in his arms. Brown, his most trustworthy friend of 30 years, who had helped him manage the farmlands, had retired to the south, surely never to be seen again. Even his dog, Luke, a faithful companion of 12 years, had given up the ghost last month. Last year, his parents had died in an avalanche, along with his daughter, her husband, and newborn child. And now, the letter in his hand was the final straw. The king's messenger had brought the news and left before he had even opened the letter. The king and his ministers, with grave regrets, were sorry to inform him of his son's death in battle, Yet died a hero, shone courage to the kingdom and his family. His name would live on in the annals of history, be inscribed on the scrolls of honor, and more of the like. It was all irrelevant. Everyone he loved, gone. There was no reason to go on. It was hopeless. Life had defeated him, and he did not have the energy to take another step. So he sat on the bench with no intention of ever getting up again. The fairy watched the old man and cried tears of sadness. The old man had farmed the lands and been steward to the forest behind the farm for the last 40 years, as had his father and his father's father, and so on for seven generations back to when the farm was first started and the king had deeded the forest to their care. The fairy could not sit and allow this wonderful old man to die of sadness. He was good. He had done good. He was no ordinary human. Something needed to be done. As the afternoon sun began to lend a golden light to the land, the old man saw a hint of motion out of the corner of his eye and slowly looked up. Hanging in the air, not three feet in front of him, 
as a fairy. She floated as her wings slowly beat the air. Around her, sparkling flitter fell away from her to fade out before reaching the ground. The old man rubbed his eyes and looked at her again. He knew instantly what she was. And she was beautiful, bathed in the sparkling golden light, and though small, she was perfectly proportioned with a mane of long flowing hair that swirled around her face and discreetly covered her breasts. The sight of the fairy was enough to wake him slightly from his stupor of sadness. The fairy gave him a sad smile and spoke to him. My lord, I am Silvertine McFay, queen of the fairy folks of the Twelve Valleys. I bid you greetings in these sad times. The old man blinked a few more times and said, My lord, why do you call me my lord? The fairy queen again smiled, but this time full of warmth. Are you not the one responsible for these twelve hectares of farmlands, six hectares of vineyards, twenty-seven hectares of grazing meadows, and beyond that, are not the four thousand hectares of forest in your care and protection? The old man shrugged. Well, yes, that's true, but I am no lord. The fairy continued in all seriousness. And have you not cared for the land, honored traditions, and respected the lore of the fae? and of Mother Gaia herself? And when others may have raped and pillaged the land, cut down the forests, and polluted the waters, did you not instead seek to live with the seasons, respecting the cycle of life, and sought to be in harmony and balance with all that is alive, seen and unseen? Have you not done this, as did your father and your father's father, for seven generations? Sir, you have been a wise steward of the land, and of all those that live above and below. And it is for all of this that we call you my lord. The old man looked up into the sky and took a deep breath. And when he exhaled, he felt some of the overwhelming sadness leave him. He looked back to the fairy and shook his head. We? You said we? Again, the fairy queen gave him that warm smile. Yes, we, my lord. And as she extended her left arm out, dozens upon dozens of fairies appeared. Men and women, and child fairy too. All watching him. And then she extended her right arm, and two dozen gnomes appeared, lined up in formation, with the wizened old gnome at the head. To the left of the gnomes, there were three tall, thin people, with slightly pointed ears. They almost melded with the trees behind them. And as the fairy waved her arms, she spoke. These are my people, the fairies of the Twelve Valleys, and this is the Gnome King and his royal guard. And these are the elfin rangers who patrol these forests on behalf of the last elfin king. The fairy queen turned back to the old man, who looked as if he could use a stiff drink. And she said, My lord, because of all you and your ancestors have done for us, we are here to pay homage to you. And with that, she bowed to the old man, and all the fairies bowed. The gnome king fell to his knee, as did his royal guard and the three elfin rangers nodded their heads in respect, which for an elf is truly saying something. The old man was overwhelmed and began to cry anew, for he felt he was receiving an honor beyond words and for which he did not deserve. The fairy queen raised herself up again and approached the old man, wiping one of his tears away before floating no more than a foot in front of him and looking him in the eyes, she said, And it is why, my lord, we beseech you to please carry on, and to remind you that where there is life, there is always hope. With a slight rustle, the gnomes faded into the grasses and bushes, and the elves blended back into the trees. 
My lord, where there is life, there is magic. With these words, the many dozens upon dozens of fairy slowly vanished in glittering sparkles of flitter until only the fairy queen remained. And there is hope, my lord. There is always hope. And the fairy queen backed away from the old man, bowed to him once more, and in an explosion of golden flitter, disappeared. The old man stayed seated till the first of the evening stars came out before walking back to the farmhouse. Three months later, as the old man chatted with the wine master, a commotion began at the front of the house. Screams went out, and a kitchen maid came running up to him, screaming with joy. She hugged the old man, something that was never done, and then she turned around and ran back to the house, telling him he must come. The old man walked across the terrace, through the French doors into the dining room, and down the hall and out the front door, there to find his son, encircled by the house staff and farmhands, who all parted for the old man. With his son was a beautiful woman. As the story goes, the army had made a mistake, and no, he was not dead. He was in fact alive and well, and newly married with a child on the way. And so had decided to leave the army and come home to live and carry on the family's responsibilities and traditions, for did they not have a legacy to maintain? And with a laugh, his son embraced his father once more, and together they all entered the house. That evening, around the midnight hour, the old man walked out through the fields to the edge of the forest. He stood up straight and with great majesty bowed to the forest. Then quietly and with a warm smile on his face walked back to his home. Oh, that was really beautiful. It was. I'm all moist eyed now. <laughs> Where there's life, there's always hope. And I think that's something we should always remember. Yeah, especially in these difficult times, with hurricanes and earthquakes, so many other hardships affecting many of us. So true. Remember, we're all in this life together. And where there's life, there really is hope. Our thoughts and prayers are with those who are constantly suffering at this time. They are. After that wonderful blessing from the Bards of Mystic, let's... Go back to the ancient Celts with Greenwood the Bard and hear the third part of his saga. The Sons of Tuiran. The story so far. Lu Longhand rallies the Fae and the Fearbolg against the Fomor, as it was foretold, but betrayal is brewing. On the equinox, the Fomori stared. The sun seemed to rise in the west. In truth, it was the light of Lu on his horse of shining breast. In Mananan's name I offer peace, he said. This mare is his own. Return the magic milch cow your king stole when he took the throne. They would not, so he warned them. War will cover you like a flood, for you refuse and reject me, though half of me is of your blood. For three days and three nights he gathered his army, Firbolg and men of day and asked each one where Kian, his father, was, but none could say. Two hundred Fomori guarded Bress, but it did him no good. The chieftains of Lu's army cut down each one where he stood. For the people's sake, Lu gave Bress his life in exchange for one thing, 
the secrets of harvest and husbandry, he denied them when he was king. Bress was exiled evermore, left alive only by Lou's grace. Lou searched his soldiers, but he could not see his father's face. Whispered on the wind, a song of the she from the hollow hills, lamenting for beneath their ground lay a man cruelly killed. In a pig pen, they sang. By sorcery he hid from his foes. Though in a man's shape they killed and buried him, but he arose. Six times the land refused to swallow up their bloody deed. The seventh time he stayed, not slain for glory, but for greed. Lou sat with King Nuada and his men at the close of day. Tell me, Silverhan, he said. What price must traitors pay? Who owes a blood fine to this man? Came Nuada's call. Three sons of Twiran, son of Ogma, rose before them all. Since you confess, said Lou, this blood fine is the price of peace. Apples from the Golden Garden, the enchanted pigskin of Greece, the burning spear of Persia, the horse that rides over the sea, the pigs of the King of the Golden Pillars you must bring to me, the hound of Yoroi, a burning spit, Victory cries on a hill. By the magic of these things we shall be healed, and foes be killed. So they took to the sea. In MacLear's mighty coracle they went, leaving their father and sister singing a sorrowful lament. The first quest of the sons of Twiran, apples of great worth, from the golden garden of wealth and wisdom in the east of the earth, the brothers flew with falcon's wings, carried off their treasures. There was sorceress and her sisters, with lightning, scorched their feathers. They flew on to the foot of Olympus, seeking the skin of the swine that transformed suffering into strength and water into wine. In wardrobe of wandering wordsmiths, they went to the king of Greece, asking the pigskin from his palace for a pledge of peace. And when he filled it up with gold to bargain with instead, they snatched the skin away, and with swinging swords they fled. By that same way they also won the spear from Persia's lord, that lived in water, for it burned as hot as fiery forge. They pledged their swords to serve the king of Shogira's fighting force, and stole away his ocean-sweeping chariot and horse leaving many mighty men with sword wounds on their breast. Those left alive spread the word of their quarrels and their quest. They sailed on to the Golden Pillars, but Esau, their king, already knew what bravery and battles they would bring. When they came for his enchanted pigs, they granted his request, on one condition, that he sailed with them on their quest. He knew full well they would seek the king of Yorway's hound. The queen was Esau's daughter, and he wished her safe and sound. So, with their newfound ally aboard, King Esau the Wise, they sailed north to Yorway, land of frost and ice. When Yorway's king refused them, even with Esau aboard, they leapt ashore and won the hound from him with strength and sword. Two brothers scattered soldiers, but safeguarded the king's wife. Brion, the eldest, caught the king and offered him his life, and in exchange, he gave to them his mighty menacing hound. So the brothers sailed to Erin with all that they had found, to pay off their blood fine to Lou with the treasures they retrieved. But little did they know, Lou had one more trick up his sleeve. As Lou looked out, the sons of Twiran sailed to the shore, wielding wondrous weapons they'd won for the coming war. But Lou would not forgive his father's fate so easily. He wove a spell, a song of forgetting, on the waves of the sea. So they gave no more thought to accomplishing their quest. Their only thought was to return to the hearth, home and rest. 
In MacLear's coracle they came home, thinking the quest complete, laid the tools and treasure they'd won at King Nuada's feet. Proudly then, they went back home to greet their family. When Lou let go of his enchantment on their memory. Now you have let go of all the wonders that you won, said Lou. Without their aid, must your last quest be done? For a cooking spit, I want the branch that burns under the sea, and victory cries on a hill. Before you bring that prize to me, on the hill of Mjochin, you must set your traitorous feet, where everyone who challenges the guards meets with defeat. They sailed farther out to sea than they had ever been, searching for care, lost isle of the sea-born fairy queen. Lost and lonely, by the wise old salmon they were saved. He showed them where the sea queen dwelt, within the wild waves. The sea fay welcomed Brion. To their underworld he came, where three times fifty maidens tended to their secret flame. For love of you, we give you what we cannot claim as yours. They sang, for light is sorely needed. On dark heron shores, the brothers went to Mjochin Hill to give the victory cries. Each one knowing in his heart they were going home to die. They fought the guardians, but sorely wounded, close to death, they laid down on the ground and gave the cries with their last breath. Their father Twiran gave the branch to Lu, the shining one, broken-hearted. He was buried in the same grave as his sons, while Ogma, Twiran's father, and Enya, Twiran's daughter, stood with Lu to fight the foe that came across the water. Flooding back. It certainly does. Yes, thank you so much, Stephen. We must be nearing the end of the show now. Well, not quite. We've got some more music, and then a look at the main gods in the Irish mythological cycle. Cool. So, what have we got for everyone in the way of music? Well, something rather special, I think. This next track again takes us to the realm of fairy, and is by the amazing harpist that we thought we heard before. After his visit to Cornwall, oh yes, um, David Helfland. That's right. Yes, it's a wonderful track called "Elven Home of the Chapel Halls," which is from his album "At the Edge of the Cornish Sea."
Oh, that was beautiful. Captured the glory of sunlight in high rafters, and the pale moonlight shining through delicate stained glass windows, and... So, are you going to write a poem, or are you just going to tell us whether you like it or not? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thumbs up, David. Really cool. It was really beautiful, though. <laughs> <laughs> it was. So, so shall we now have a look at the main characters in the Irish mythological cycle? The gods, the she nobility. Yes, and while we're at it, let's give another mention to the Isles of Many Gods by Sarita Deste and David Rankin. We read from the introduction before, so let's look at what they have to say about the gods we've met in the stories. It's a good idea. Hmm. It'll give us a basis to work from. Shall we start with Lou, as we've just had part of his story in the Sons of Twiran? Why not? What does it say? I'll have to paraphrase and pick out some interesting bits, because there's an awful lot here. They say Lou is the son of Enya, daughter of Balor, and Kian, son of Diankecht, and his name may mean Shining One. Lu was the god of all crafts, and it's easy to see why the Romans equated him with Mercury, who was their many-skilled god. He was the carrier of one of the four magic treasures of the Tuatha Dé the Spear of Lu. He's also the father of Cahulun, and helps him when Cahulun is badly wounded. He's equated with the Welsh god Llai Llau Gafes and the Gaelic Lugus. Yes, that all seems fair enough. I wonder whether we can make another association, though. The Morrigan calls him the Child of Promise, mm. and he constantly comes across as a youth. And I wonder there, if there, he can be linked with the mysterious Welsh god, the Mabon, which means the sun. Hmm, maybe. Although the Mabon is often linked to Pryderi, the son of Pwych. But we haven't got to these stories yet. However, the Mabon is linked with the Modron, the son to the mother. And the mother in our tales is most definitely Danu. She certainly is. Although other goddesses seem to take on aspect of the Divine Mother at times as well, don't they? Hmm. Like the Morrigan representing the sovereignty of Ireland when she mates with the Dagda. But what does our book say? Well, it says that Danu and Anu are versions of the same name, and they mean river and wealth, respectively. It implies a connection to the treasures of the earth. Danu was married to the death god Bile. We haven't heard much about him in the tales, have we? No, but together they bore the Dagda, who does crop up in the tales as one of the great old ones. Just as she is the mother of all Fae, the children of Danu, so Bile is described in the book as meaning tree, possibly implying an ancestor god. Although I've also heard him described as the god of death. And the Dagda is so fertile he sires many children and is the god described as mating with the Morrigan in her aspect as the sovereignty of Erin. Mm. Mm. And talking of the Morrigan, she is one of the most fascinating goddesses in the pantheon or family of gods. What does the book have to say about her? Well, she's one of my favourites, I have to say. And the book says she's called the Great Queen, the Terrible Queen, the Fairy Queen and the Queen of Death. It's a lot of jobs. Hmm, it is. And as we know from the story, she would stride across the battlefield and the book reminds us that she never fought on a losing side. Hmm. I think one of the major things that we've actually learned from the stories is that she was a triune goddess, a trinity. Yes, the Morrigan, or sometimes Morrigu, seems to have been a title of three ferocious goddesses in one. Bav, the battle crow, Macha, the hearth mother, and the Morrigan as an individual. If we compare these three with the typical neo-pagan idea of the triple goddess, Macha is obviously the mother, albeit the wronged and ferocious mother, and I tend to equate Bav with the single-minded fury of the young, i.e. the maiden, and the Morigo as the crone, hmm. or Kailuch. Hmm. It's not simple, though, is it? Because in some places, Bav is referred to later on as the Kaila, or crone, and the Morigo is frequently... Morigo, I believe, is a pure, as plural, isn't it? Is it? Hmm. Yes. Ah. So, so Morigo is singular and Morigo is plural? I think so, ah. yes. I wasn't sure. I thought it was the other way around. No. Okay. I think, it's, I think Morig Morigo is pl plural. And the Morrigan is frequently seen as trying to seduce young warriors, such as Cahulin, so therefore must have had an allure or a power to do so. She also had a habit of going across the battlefields on a horse naked. Does she? She does, yes. In later tales, 
You will find out Achille and Maeve. She turns up naked on a, on a horse. Oh, right. Hmm. Right, the Ulster cycle. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to leave that out? I can do, actually. She actually does ride naked and all the men can't resist her. And it's her and... not in their book either. Oh, is it not? But it is actually there. Okay. The whole seduction of young warriors, well, that's all what that's about. Interesting, huh? Mm. The mother, Maka, may compare to the goddess Keridwen in the Welsh tales, as she too was a wronged and ferocious mother. Mm, that's just a thought. Mm, very true. Mm. Sometimes the Morrigan is also equated with Danu, the primordial mother goddess. I guess we just have to accept that either the Celts held every goddess to be part or an aspect of the great goddess, mm -hmm. or that different clans or tribes held slightly different views that have all become mixed up in the manuscripts. I think that's probably all possible, to be honest. However, shall we move on and have take a look at Goban, or Goivnu, as he's sometimes known? Ah, uh, yes, the smith god. Mm -hmm. In early times, the art of smithing was considered to be a magical art, sort of like the art of alchemy, turning something base into something very precious, such as a sword or spear. Goban, in particular, made spears that never missed and always killed. The book tells us that he was part of a triad with Luchta, who made the spear shafts, and Kredne, who made the rivets. Oh yes, I remember that now. The book also reminds us that he hosted other world feasts and provided a magical ale that gave immortality to all those who drank it. Did you know they frequently drank ale warm? How do you mean? Hmm. Well, the irons would be heated in the fire and placed into the cup, so the drinks were instantly warmed. Nice and warm for women and children on a cold night. And with added honey, very comforting, I should imagine. <laughs> Hence the relationship of ale to the smith. Oh, I see. I see. But fighting and drinking, you know, my sort of god. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, one of the lessons we do learn from Goban is that the Celts regarded the number three, or multiples of, as magical and sacred. It took Goban three steps to make one of his magical spears. All the way through the tales, any time we encounter the number three, it has a connection with she power or the power of the Fae. And we think this is where the Celts believe magic came from. Yeah, which is why I had Lou reach into the she world to pull out his spear to throw at the mighty Balor, his grandfather. What about Angus Og? Angus the Young? Ah... Boan, goddess of the river Boyne, said, Young is the sun who was begotten at the break of day and born betwixt it and evening. Hmm. I have noticed that in-between times held a special power for the Celts. Yes, they do. And because of this, Angus is sometimes equated with the Welsh Mabon, the sun. He's both the god of love, whose kisses fly around him as sweet birds, and the trickster of gods. He managed to trick mighty Dagda out of Bruna Boyne, if you remember. To have as his own home. I do, mm. I do. And um, possibly now will be a good time to remind everyone that the brew, now called Newgrange, is under threat by the expansion of roads in Ireland. And it's just our opinion, but let's all do what we can to protect our ancient sacred sites. Links will be in the show notes. Absolutely. Now let's finish off by talking about Bridget or Breed and the Diankecht. Breed, whose name means the exalted one, was the daughter of Dagda, and like the Morrigan, was also a triple goddess. I've actually seen a photograph of a statue showing her in triple form. She is the goddess of crafts, including smithing, healing and poetry. The bright arrow of inspiration, so to speak. Historically, she later became the first female bishop, Bridget, didn't she? Yes, she did. And she was made into a saint, whatever yes. the word is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Canonised as uh, um, St. Bridget. Yep. One of the many traditions assigned to her is that she and nine nuns, multiples of three again, guarded a sacred fire that was never allowed to go out. Light made manifest. Interestingly, before the, um, before the nuns were there, there's a story that the, uh, a shrine to Bridget was there before the nuns arrived. Is this Kildare? Where... Yes, that's right. And there were nine priestesses that guarded the flame. Really? Mm. Ah. Mm. So this looks like a, an ancient tradition. It's obviously, a, yeah, like you say, an ancient tradition that's been carried on under different names. The nine priestesses appear other places. If you keep listening to the show, you might find out too where they are. Mm. Mm. Yes, nine seems to be 
almost as significant as three. It does. <laughs> That's right. And there are some links here to Dianket, the healer of the Tuatha His or her name means swift or powerful judge and has several fathers depending on which manuscript you read. We've got a feeling that Dianket was not so much of a name but a, more of a title that was passed down to the next skilled inheritor. Mm. So I suppose the same could be said of many of the gods as their names seem to reflect a skill or a role. The Dianket has a very strange story. Do you remember where he becomes jealous and kills his son mm. when he shows greater skill than he possesses? This only makes sense if the then-current Dianket position and standing in the clan depended on how good his skill was. Hmm, interesting thoughts. Hmm. OK, let's end our overview of the gods there, with many thanks to David Rankin and Sri Deste for the Isles of Many Gods, a superbly informative book that you can find details of in our show notes. And perhaps we could move on and have some... Music! Yay! Yay! OK. <laughs> As bound to cause distortion. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> this track is called I'll Meet You in Ireland, and it's by Cray Van Kirk, who believes in music without borders and music without costs. An amazing man. Mm. You can find out more about Cray and his mission in our show notes, as well as the lyrics to Cray Van Kirk's I'll Meet You in Ireland. Rock silent beside her And with a thousand thoughts I never could deny And she said, I love you Will you hold me And watch me jump the fire As summer turns to night And I called to her Through the sky And through the whispers of flight I will meet you by the river's green I will meet you by a shining sea I will meet you as the waves march on I will wait for you on the shores of Ireland Time offers, we choose them And the wildest fire can die beneath the rain I know you in silence And at the journey's end We'll blow the fire flame And the masks that you wear Through the years They will burn as they fly I will meet you by the river's green I will meet you by a shining sea I will meet you as the waves march on I will wait for you on the shores of Ireland The changeling turns now and sets her silver sails Until time and time and times again are done I will meet you by the river's green I will meet you by a shining sea I will meet you as the waves march on I will wait for you through the and I will wait for you, my love I will wait for you on the shores of Ireland I will meet you by the rivers green I will meet you by a shining sea I will meet you as the waves march on I will wait for you through the years And I will wait for you, my love I will wait for you on the shores of Ireland. That was... Cray Van Kirk with I'll Meet You in Ireland from his website, CrayVanKirk.com.
Lovely music, Craig. Thank you. It was beautiful. I want to go back to Ireland now. Can mm. I go back to the Emerald Isle, please? Well, I've never been, so pack me a suitcase. I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> In the meantime, let's hear the last stanzas of Greenwood the Bard's epic version of our story. And I think it's my turn to start, so why don't you tell us where we got to? OK, then. Promises kept. The story so far. Lou, prophesied saviour of Erin, has cleansed his court of treachery and gathered the wealth and weapons he needs. Let battle commence. The champions and chieftains of Erin, gathered on Tara's green, led by Lu, the mightiest host the Isle had ever seen. Dagda and Orgm, of divine bloodline, blew the horns in their hands, and beacon fires lit up every hilltop in the land. Every soldier... Every soothsayer, every smith, every sage joined the she-host hidden in the hills from ancient age. Margan, mistress of magicians, sang an ancient spell, invoked the aid of Erin's every river, lake and well. For every sword or shield or spear broken in the fight, Goban the skillful smith would forge another twice as bright. With healing herbs, Diankecht and his children sang their spells, made their wounded warriors whole in the waters of their well. Orgma challenged every Fomori champion, hand to hand, and Dagda's cauldron never failed with food for every man. Morrigan swept overhead with raven's wing and claw a shadow making weaklings of the hardiest for war. Ruadan, son of exiled Bres, blocked up the healing well and struck at Goban. But the smith fought back and Ruadan fell. The cry of his mother, Breed, daughter of Dagda, lingered long. And in the same way, fallen friends were mourned from that day on. Nine foster fathers guarded Lou, afraid he would fall in the fight. But he broke free, swept over the battlefield with blinding light. And Lou faced Balor, his grandfather, as was prophesied, with the burning spear from Tir Nanog. He put out his evil eye. The Fomori, foes of Erin, Face defeat on Moitura's plain. Lord Dagda and Lady Morrigan renewed their pact again. But victory was not so easily won for Lou Longhand. For only by saving Bress's life could he truly save the land. For Bress held secrets no one knew of farming and forestry. Without him, they would face the cold, hard winter helplessly. Balor's evil eye had slain King Nuada Silverhand, and it was left to Lou alone to judge the fate of the land. The Fate of the Fae The sun rose over Moitora, the grass was red as the sky. They named it Plain of Pillars, for the tombs of all who died. Bress revealed his secret knowledge of crops, the price of peace. In exchange for stolen cattle returned, the exile was released. Ogma found the Orna, ancient sword of the Fomori kings, heard its song, and so taught his folk how to recount great things. Nuada's old bard saw the king's final resting place, fresh and green. He closed his eyes and saw it, and he never awoke from that dream. Lu, Dagda and Ogma face Bress and his kin once again, hunting Dagda's stolen harp, whose song brought sun and rain. Dagda played, made them laugh and weep and sleep with his skill. In that cold cave, the last for more may yet be sleeping still. Morrigan promised warmth in winter, fruitfulness in the frost. She foretold the end of things, when love and loyalty would be lost. Then she rejoined the ancient Fae 
and faded into the sky. But every Samhain to this day, we feel her watchful eye. Lou's foster mother died, and in her honour he proclaimed, and on that day each year would be a gathering for games. His mother wed Nuada's son, and of their line, I'm told, came Finn of the Fianna and blessed Bran the Bold. Lou wandered to the centre of Erin, where a sacred flame was lit by the sons of Nemed, and he was never seen again. Dagda took the throne, but Danu's folk had their day, and not long after, even Dagda's own kin went away. Angus, his son by Boanna, whose soul dwells in the Boyne, loved the Swan Princess and would not rest till they were joined. She dwelt on Dragon's Lake where mortals could not be received, except on one night of the year, and so on Samhain Eve. He saw her when the misty veil parted, and he cried, I am Ingus, skilled in arts of love. I long to be by your side. On white wings they flew together, and forever left the land. But the Fae had one more part to play in the affairs of man. The Coming of the Gale Dugda the Great, Goban the Skillful, their fate is a mystery. But Lu Longhand's name is whispered down through history. He watched over Cahulin as he fought for Kuli's cattle. He heard the call of the Lear Four, the con of the Hundred Battles, the Blessed Stone that called out only for a rightful king. And so Lu gave the hand of she who guards the throne to him. From that day on, the bards and druids of Con searched the skies, knowing the Tuahade Danan looked down with watchful eyes. Another pair of eyes looked to the land from Spanish shores. The gale, they say, rose from the ashes of the Trojan War. The sons of Meal, chief clan of the gale, sailed for the Isle of Green. For Eith, the eldest son of Meal, had seen it in a dream. With his son Lugi and his band of ninety men, he sailed. And to his joy, they gave him greeting in the tongue of the gale. The locals took him to the nobles, where judgment was decided. And he heard them judging how the wealth of kings should be divided. Three brothers, grandsons of the Dagda, jointly ruled the land. Each in turn for a year and a day had the high kingship in his hand. But how should wealth and weapons be divided by the brothers? This land, said Eith, is blessed with peace and plenty above others. Surely not one of you is so afraid to fail and fall. If by success or sacrifice you serve the good of all. The judges raged. Not only did he want their land himself, but also mocked and shamed them for their wisdom and their wealth. They cast him out. He fought them off, and of his wounds he died. His every clansman gathered to avenge their wounded pride. A tribe of warrior poets, led by Lugi, his firstborn, set sail with the gale of Brigantia at dawn. First the wife of their chief bard, Amagin Whiteney, and then Iranan, youngest of the clan, were lost at sea. But even though the she guarded the land with mist and storm, the coming of the gale was as inevitable as the dawn. The Song of Amagin By magic the Fae kept the gale away, would not let them land. But one river mouth was open, so they stepped onto the strand. Wise Amagin led the way, for bards were protected by law. And one by one, the three queens of Erin met them on the shore. Wives of the King of Hazel, King of the Plough and King of the Sun. That her name be on the land was the desire of each one. 
Each had the power to bless or curse, but Eriu promised more. So Erin was the name of the land of the Gale, evermore. The kings ever quarrelled, but on this they all agreed. The Gale would go back beyond the ninth wave of the sea. And if they could find their way back and fight the wild weather, the lordship of the land would be in their hands forever. So they fought against the sea and the sorcery of the she, but the swells could not withstand the spells of Amagan Whitney, for he invoked the spirit realm of Erin's land itself, prophesying the sons of Mill would bring wisdom and wealth. So the gale reached the land and claimed it for their own, and Amagan's voice echoed through the hills of his new home. The wind and the waves of the sea, the sound of the sea on the land, the stag who looks to the sky, the hawk on the cliff where he stands, sunlight falling like teardrops, flowers fed to the eye, the boldest boar, the swimming salmon. In all these am I. I water plains, inspire artists, give plunder to spears. I sing now through this bard. My song turns the wheel of the year. The Fae defeated themselves when they scattered the Gale host. For when their ships came into land, they covered the length of the coast. The men of day put up no fight. Their time was at an end. The age of man was dawning. It was time for wounds to mend. The shining ones retreated to the realms of the hollow hills, but the three queens stayed, and silently they watch over us still. The children's children of the sons of Mill would fill the land. And that was when the songs and stories of Erin really began. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much to Stephen, also known as Greenwood the Bard, for writing this epic and allowing us to read it. Yes, thank you so much, Stephen. You're a very talented bard. Let's hope we hear more of your work in later shows. Mm. I think we're winding to a close now, aren't we? Well, almost. We've got one more song from you, from the amazing Dave the Bard, and a little news about the competition. Oh, yes. Do you remember we offered up the very last copy of the only pressing of the Pentacle Drummer's CD, Life in Tatters, a surprise? Yes. Well. We didn't say when the competition would end. Oh, no, you're right. Let's have a quick listen to the Pentacle Drummers with Rumbling Thunder to remind us what this pounding band sound like.
great stuff. Fun to play as well. So, we forgot to give an end date? Yes. So let's say we'll announce the winner in the Samhain show. And the deadline for your entries will be the 20th of October. Okay, sounds fair. Mm. So go back and have a listen to the competition in the Chatterbox show, where you'll hear some of the brilliant drumming, and drop us a line with the answer by the 20th of October. And, uh, and didn't you mention something about Dave the Bard? Hmm. Well, there can't be many of our listeners now that haven't actually heard of Dave the Bard. He's one of those very rare musicians who sings of the ancient Celtic gods and all sorts of other energies, and you can actually feel those energies flow through the music. Well, as we mentioned, there is a film being made inspired by his music called The Spirit of Albion, and we've been very privileged to be allowed to attend many of the shoots. We'll be bringing you some interviews and behind-the-scenes chat later on, in later shows. Amazingly, the film carries the same energies. It certainly does. And I really can't wait to see it. No, me neither. <laughs> but to sing us out of this combined Irish summary and Equinox show, let's listen to Dave the Bard and his so very powerful Land of the Ever Young from his album The Hills They Are Hollow.
the freedom of the skies Up here where the seagull flies All around me, around me And now I can never return To the way I once had been Here I'll come gone. with me and I'll take you away To the land of the ever young Through the hills to the home of the fae Where the air is warm by the sun It's all around, just listen And I will take you there Dave, that was beautiful as ever. Thank you. It certainly was. And don't forget to find Dave on iTunes with his own podcast called Druidcast, where he plays much more music and has many fascinating interviews. And so I think that's it. In our next episode, we start to discuss the origins of the Welsh myths and that fascinating book that we know as the Mabinogion. Well, finally, we're actually nearly there. (laughs) I'm really looking forward to that. So how many episodes do you think it will take to cover the Welsh myths then? I've no idea. There's quite a lot of material, so I'd guess at least the same as the Irish myths that we've covered so far. Hmm. So about 30 episodes then? Something like that. Hmm. Well, let's see how close you are. (laughs) (laughs) Okay then, but I'll be miles off. We're just about ready to go, but before we do, we'd like to introduce the newest member of our team. Yes, she's been a family friend for many years and now wants to help us out with the show. So let's give a huge welcome to Karina. Hi. Hello. 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 Hi, guys. <laughs> welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. So what are you going to be helping us out with? Well, being a bit microphone shy, you probably won't hear that much from me. <laughs> That's what moment. she thinks. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll be the one behind the scenes, beavering away, helping with uh, databases, bit of organisation, cool. and mainly making cups of tea. Excellent. Even better. Yes, yeah. brilliant. I think you guys are probably going to be pulling me into some of the stories. Yep, of course we are. You betcha. <laughs> you didn't think you were going to get away with it, did you? Oh, well, you can count on it. <laughs> but we'll carry on our chat for a bit in the app extra. But I think that really does wrap up this show. Yes, I'm afraid it does. And our next show could be the first of our Welsh story shows, a salmon holiday special, or even something completely unexpected. Absolutely. So uh, we'll just keep you guessing then. Can I join in with a goodbye? Yeah, sure. It's pronounced huil vawr. And it means goodbye and have fun. Cool. So, one, two, three. Huil vawr. You've been listening to the Celtic Myth Pod Show. Available from CelticMythPodShow.com. We hope you've enjoyed the show and we'll stay tuned for the next episode. You can send us an email or some voice feedback to Gary and Ruth at CelticMythPodShow.com. The show notes for this episode can also be found on the website. We'd like to say a special thank you to Kulan's Hounds, who provided us with the theme music for our show. Find them at www.sfhounds.com We'd also like to say a big thank you to Anne Bruce, Master Harper and Keltoria, with a K, 
Celtic New Age Music, who have both given the show unrestricted access to their music. And thanks again go to Diane Arkinstone and Kim Robertson, whose music has been used as some of the transitions you've heard in this show. You'll find links to all of these wonderful artists in the show notes at shownotes.celticmythpodshow.com. <laughs>